Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to another exciting live session of Abbott Online. For those who are joining us for the first time, a special warm welcome to you. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning, the work we do, and more information of our wonderful partners this evening. We've completed six exciting months of online programming thus far, and since April this year, when we first introduced our digital further learning campaign, Avid Online. Our social media platforms have been a buzz since then with a mix of live sessions and avid online videos. We've covered topics and issues from across the breadth of the arts and connected with our ever growing online community with a wide range of local, national and international speakers, truly bringing the best from around the world to your screens and ensuring that even in these tough times, we stay true to our mantra that learning never stops. Now, beginning the seventh month, we have curated and published almost 130 programs and counting. We're still going strong and continue to spread the positivity of the arts to uplift, educate, and inspire our community. We continue to evolve our campaign by expanding our formats, reintroducing our existing IPs, and working with our long-term collaborators to present thematic programs and series. And this brings me to our evening session, which is part of Blurring Boundaries, a virtual month that aims to engage with emerging voices from the visual arts and established voices from design, while examining areas where various aspects and disciplines of the arts intersect. Tonight, the Kalagora Arts Association and Avid Learning present Fantasy Architecture, a live session with architect, professor of Sir JJ College of Architecture and poet, Mustan Dalvi, who will address the fascinating topic of whimsical architecture and fantasy, weaving in an element of poetry. Welcome, Professor Dalvi. For more about him, please refer to the bio, which has been pasted in the, posted in the chat section. You should have also received it in your email confirmation. As many of you know, he is a professor of architecture and brings with him a wealth of knowledge on the topic at hand. In today's session, Professor Dalby will tell us more about the inclusion of fantastical elements in built structures by examining a broad range of architectural productions that have pushed the boundaries of tradition. Please note that the session will last 75 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A. So please post your questions in the Q&A box throughout the session, and we'll be happy to take them at the end. On that note, thank you for tuning in. I leave you in the capable hands of Professor Dalvi and look forward to a fascinating session. Over to you, Mr. Answer. Thank you, Asad. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I must begin by thanking Avid and the Kalagoda Association, Asad, uh, Dhwani, Brinda Miller, and many of the others who have worked uh, behind the scenes to make not only my uh, talk, but a whole series of talks uh, possible on a variety of subjects. Uh, Asad began by talking about blurring boundaries, and I think that is uh, exactly my uh, theme for today, because in talking about fantasy architecture, I would also like to talk about the ideas that come through in these fantastic imaginations, not only through the built form, but also through a variety of unbuilt, uh, but imagined uh, ideas about architecture, whether they are in, uh, in literature, in novels, in poetry, perhaps, in art, uh, in cinema, and uh, also try to see the, the kind of uh, ideas going from one medium to the other, you know, like memes uh, transcending both time and space, but uh, remaining as embedded in the visual imagination so that something even more than a hundred years back can easily be uh, brought back into uh, contemporary currency uh, even today. 
So uh, with your permission, I will share my screen and begin my presentation. Let me begin by invoking Hamlet uh, with his very wonderful quote, uh, where he says this, Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have had bad dreams. Uh, perhaps a lot of the fantasy elements in architecture emerge from the nightmarish uh, and then make their way into the real world uh, through this whole kind of you know, location of dreams, of imagination, of memories. All these tend to coincide, they tend to be buffeted against each other and emerge in a variety of ways, uh, sometimes giving us delight, but sometimes going in quite the other direction. Let me start with a story. In 1884, Sarah Winchester, the widow of the gun magnet, William Winchester, started adding to a mansion in San Jose, California. She claimed that the mansion was haunted by the ghosts of all those killed with Winchester rifles. Under her day-to-day -day guidance, the reconstruction of this mansion proceeded without interruption until her death in 1922, at which time all building activity came to an instant halt. Winchester's property was about 162 acres. It had 161 rooms, including 40 bedrooms, two ballrooms, 47 fireplaces, uh, 17 chimneys, and three elevators. It had gold and silver chandeliers, hand-inlaid parquet floors and trim. Uh, but at the same time, it had a whole series of spaces which were actually decoys. You had rooms that were not rooms, doors that were looked like doors but opened onto blank walls staircases that went to nowhere. All of these were built so that the ghosts that, uh, that Sarah Winchester was obsessed with would not be able to reach her uh, and haunt her. Uh, this is a true story in, in terms of the building that was built. And probably one of the best ways to segue into this notion of the fantastic. And through the course of this lecture, what I would like to do is to explore the idea of the fantastic. Uh, incidentally, this is a word which comes uh, from the German fantasien or fantasia uh, from the Latin, which means to make visible. So fantasy architecture works on the willingness to believe in something that is unreal or surreal and to sacrifice the logic of realism for enjoyment. And for the duration of this presentation, I would call upon you to do just that. Because I would like through this uh, presentation to explore the idea not only of the, fantas of the fantastic, of fantasy, but also of the whimsical. And as an architect, that of the visionary to kind of see whether you know, certain visions which are evoked in the imagination can have their place in the real world uh, that we live in. Samuel Taylor Coleridge has talked about fantasy as that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. He talks about the awakening of the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and wonders of the world before us. Architectural fantasies actually have been evoked at several points in history. Uh, I'd just begin with this very interesting uh, evocation of space, uh, which is actually the passage or the pathway to hell uh, as seen in uh, Dante's Inferno. In this 14th century epic poem, The Divine Comedy, 
uh, Dante talks about his journey to hell, guided by the ancient Roman poet Virgil. So Virgil proceeds to uh, guide Dante through the nine circles of hell. These are concentric circles representing a gradual increase in wickedness, which means that as you go down these many levels, people who are more and more and more wicked are uh, classified uh, through the depth of the levels at which they are found. Uh, and it culminates at the center of, the, uh, of, of this, this deep hole where Saturn is held in bondage. So the sinners in each circle are punished for eternity in a fashion fitting their crimes. And there is a whole lot of amazingly uh, sadomasochistic uh, uh, kind of uh, descriptions of what happens to people based on their sins. So the vivid descriptions of hell allow us to willingly suspend our disbelief and share the torments and confusions uh, of, uh, of, of Dante and Virgil as they descend into the pit of hell, like a series of spiraling basements going down and further down, as can be seen in this drawing of uh, uh, which, which evokes uh, 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 the vision of hell as an inverted underground subterranean structure. Let us take this image and just turn it on its head. And what we get is this. We get the Tower of Babel. And this is the very famous painting uh, of the Tower of Babel by Bruegel the Elder, done in 1563, uh, now located in the Kunsthistorische Museum uh, in Vienna. And in this painting, uh, according to the book of Genesis, what has been described is the construction of the Tower of Babel which was built by a unified monolingual humanity as a mark of their achievement to prevent them from being dispersed. And to quote from Genesis 11.4, uh, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. And this is considered to be uh, uh, an act of supreme vanity and God, angered by their vanity, gives them all, the people who are building this tower, the gift of many, many tongues, uh, okay, leading to a babble of languages that stops the construction dead in its tracks. So two fantastic images, one that goes into the earth, one that rises to the heaven. But in both cases, there is always more to it than just the visual uh, image. And probably when we talk of fantasists, there's no greater one than J.R.R. Tolkien, who in his essay on fairy stories, talks about the paradigm of secondary belief based on the inner consistency of reality. And I do not think that anyone has evoked the inner consistency of reality of a truly fantastic situation better than Tolkien has in his epic uh, uh, series, uh, The Lord of the Rings, where he allows us to immerse ourselves in a vast fantasy universe, each of which is believable at that very point, and even allows ourselves to feel the comfort of home, uh, what the Germans called a Gemutlichkeit, you know, the, a very comfortable kind of space when he imagines the Shire, which is the home of the Hobbits. And everyone I'm sure can recognize this image from the film, uh, The Lord of the Rings. And when one enters uh, the home of, of uh, Bilbo Baggins, which is at Bag End, this is what one sees. Uh, this home too is brought to us with enough consistency by Peter Jackson in the films to make the experience both familiar and strange at the same time. But how can we appreciate architecture that is actually built that is truly strange? 
look at this building. This is a building built in 2004 in Sopot, Poland, uh, and is called Crooked Little House. Uh, this was designed by the architects Tozinski and Zaleski, who were inspired by fairy tale illustrations, especially of an illustrator, a Swedish graphic designer called Per Dahlberg. And this is one of Per Dahlberg's illustrations. Uh, he creates, his illustrations create architectural drawings that are both magical and dreamlike. Uh, you will never find a straight line in these, in his works. And these, the whole series, I'm just showing you one example uh, of his illustrations of buildings, of cities, of architecture, actually inspired this utterly fantastical uh, building. Uh, which was built in Poland. When we talk about really built works, perhaps there is no greater uh, executor of fantastic buildings than Antoni Gaudi. Uh, and all his buildings in Barcelona are considered to be uh, a whole series of masterworks of the fantastic. And this close up is from one of his very famous uh, houses called the Casa Batlo uh, in the center of Barcelona. Uh, this house was a remodel of a previously built house, uh, redesigned in 1904 by Gaudi in the style that we now call Art Nouveau. Uh, and uh, Art Nouveau had the uh, very important function of being, uh, of doing two things essentially. One is resisting the current classicism and revivalistic styles, which were very, very prevalent at that time, uh, which we have even seen in a place like Bombay in the neoclassical and the neo-Gothic and so on. And the desire to create something entirely original that did not have uh, you know, any historical precedent. Uh, so uh, this building uh, also takes all its inspiration from natural and organic uh, kind of forms. There are very few straight lines in this building. Much of the facade, as you can see, and I'll show you more images, uh, is decorated with a colorful mosaic of broken ceramic tiles. And the lower parts have this uh, very interesting series of uh, columnar elements, which made this building uh, get its own nickname, very popularly called in Barcelona as the Casa dels Osos, or the House of Bones. This is the building in its entirety, and you can see how it is located next to more uh, conventionally uh, built designs. It fits in, but it does not fit in, and I think that is a, a very important aspect of uh, the, the element of fantasy also. But this is not only the story. The story is also that of resistance because Barcelona is the capital of Catalonia and Catalonia has, has always been at loggerheads with the capital Madrid and there has always been a moment uh, of uh, separation of independence from Madrid and Gaudi was one of the uh, at, at the forefront of that uh, notion of being independent of Madrid. And so in this building, the amazing roof which you see actually is a sign of that resistance. Because if I ask you what does the roof look like, you will probably say what everyone else says, that it looks like the back of a dragon with its scales, uh, with its spines. And there is also emerging from it a uh, a spear-like element which ends in a cross. And this is a, a, a symbolic of St. George, who is the patron saint of Catalonia and the, the dragon which he slays. And obviously, you can work out for yourself now who is the good St. George and who is the evil, the dragon, uh, in this kind of political uh, binary. Uh, Visiting this building uh, in 2009 also kind of evoked uh, a, a piece of writing 
a poem which I wrote, which I would like to read out to you, uh, showing you images at very at 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 close up, so you can see what this architecture looks like when you are within touching distance uh, of it, and it also evokes the story of Gaudi's death, which was an extremely uh, unfortunate kind of incident because having spent his whole life uh, working on building the great church in the center of Barcelona, the Sagrada Familia, uh, he lived almost like a pauper, even though he was the most important or the most well-known uh, person in Barcelona. And his uh, disheveled appearance made him almost a nobody on the street. And he died being knocked down by a vehicle and uh, kind of lay there without anyone noticing for a very long time uh, that uh, it was Gaudi, in fact, who had been knocked down in this accident. And that is how he died. So all those are ideas I have evoked in this very uh, short poem. But I would also like to say that all the images that you will see while I am reading uh, this poem are from the Casa Batlo, as well as from the Sagrada Familia, but in very great close-up. And they were all taken quite recently uh, by my friend and photographer, Himangi Kadu, who is currently uh, studying uh, figural art in Barcelona. So thank you for these images. So this is the uh, poem. The great reptile gazes down at the deliberate fissure of New Spain. Inchered scales click in climatic readjustment, cutting off rays, the sunset scatters over ceramic shards. The great reptile gazes down the deliberate fissure of New Spain. From his vantage, the Catalonian knight measures the cardinal's glance, facing down the next hundred years, seeing much, doing nothing. Carapace crackling in the heat of the Barcelona sunset, the reptile barely spares a glance at the falling man and instead tightens his scalene grip on the bedrock. His claws append the earth in funicular steadiness. Barcelona gathers to watch. The envoy from Madrid avoids his touch enters under whitewashed pediments to regular eight-course meals. The cross of Bartolo, the gecko at Guel, denizens from the sea-swept crags of Mila, half-executed angels from the Sagrada Familia, ignore the man in the torn overcoat, the receding clip-clops of the hit-and-run cart. They have their own agendas, and could wait out the martyrdom of another Catalan patriot rather than spare a thought for a decrepit body that lays down in the larger scheme of life. I move on now to another set of ideas, and these are of a fantastic architecture that is actually built not by architects, perhaps, but by the ordinary folk who try to bring their imagination and their symbolism in the buildings that they create. Uh, considered to be very lowbrow at one time, they were kind of brought into prominence by the writings of the architects, Robert Venturi, uh, Denis Scott Brown, and Stephen Eisenhower, who when they wrote their fantastic uh, book, Learning from Las Vegas, presented the idea of this kind of architecture in the form of a duck. And you can see that image drawn by Venturi in this, where the building is itself a symbol. Uh, it's often built by the owners themselves and is considered almost like a kind of pop architecture. So what is this? A building that looks like a duck. Much of this architecture can be seen as fantastic, but is the work of the ordinary individuals. And these buildings are normally built outside of the pale 
of both the bureaucracy as well as of the more kind of elitist architectural uh, fraternity and they bring uh, something very new into the landscape so buildings that look like things and this is very literally one example of that another example of that is this one uh, built in 1922 this is called the t dome and it is built just outside of washington and it was built as a reminder of a of a scandal and that scandal was a great bribery incident uh, that happened in uh, the united states uh, it was called the t dome scandal during the administration uh, of the president warren harding another building that looks like something uh, is actually evoked in uh, a very lesser known novel of the great science fiction writer jules verne i wonder how many of you have heard of a novel called tigers and traitors and this novel uh, takes place or is located in 1857 in india just when the first uprising the first uh, war of revolution against the colonial stranglehold uh, uh, emerges and it talks about a group of uh, bada sahibs who travel through the countryside of uh, india uh, on shikar on on shooting trips to kill tigers and the way they do that is in the form of this uh, this train which is actually like which is a steam engine uh, in reality only it is shaped like a la like an elephant which kind of uh, you know clomps its way through the grasslands and the forests Uh, of northern india uh, while very obviously the common populace look up in awe at it and of course at some point uh, these shikaris also get involved in the revolution that is happening but closer to home we can see this building which has actually been built and was uh, was opened in 2012 uh, now called the fish building it is actually the regional office of the national fisheries uh, development board located near hyderabad in india so uh, architecture can do a variety of things uh, and at its simplest and most simplistic simply evoke that which uh, you know causes it to happen like in this case <clears throat> a fishery building that looks like a fish let me take you a little away from this idea into something uh, uh slightly different and let us talk a little bit about fantastic architecture as being visionary architecture you know where visionary architecture is essentially you know envisioning something that can happen in the future uh being ahead of its time being the avant garde but is fantastic at any given moment of time Uh, in 1960 the museum of modern art in new york put up an exhibition of architecture that was unbuilt considered far too revolutionary and from their catalog these very stirring words were written that today virtually nothing an architect can think of is technically impossible to realize social usage which includes economics determines what is visionary and what is not visionary projects like plato's ideal forms cast their shadow into the real world of experience expense and frustration if we could learn what they have to teach we might exchange irrelevant rationalizations for more useful critical standards vision and reality might then coincide one of the visions at that time that really evoked the consciousness of uh, that period which was please remember also a period of certain optimism because the 60s parallel the space race uh, between the united states and the uh, uh, and 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 russia and the soviet union and uh, technological advancement was considered to be a very important step at that time and perhaps uh, no technologist was as visionary as buckminster fuller uh who 
who proposed uh, buckminster fuller was the the inventor shall we say he is the one who worked out the the geodesic dome which is so common in our world today but in the 60s you had the first uh, great examples of the geodesic dome uh, which was seen especially in uh, expos that were happening in the us and in other parts of the world but buckminster fuller's vision was much bigger than that he proposed covering a part of new york city uh, with a massive monumentally large geodesic dome uh, which was intended to regulate climatic conditions and curtail energy uh, usage this building i mean this vision was never realized but has remained in the imagination of architects of uh, of uh, visionaries and much later in almost i think in 2015 was brought back by the uh, by the author stephen king in a very interesting novel uh, which he wrote called under the dome uh, he rekindled this notion i have in the beginning i talked to you about how ideas move from one place to the other uh, he reimagined the buckminster fuller's manhattan dome as a fantastic although fictional dome that descends one day on a small town in america separating the people inside the town from the world outside and then there is a whole series of politics that kind of emerges from the within and the without so fantastic architecture can get incorporated in uh, fiction in novels in a very interesting way and i will talk about uh, a few examples of that but let's talk about some projects that were never built amongst them one of the most famous is this one uh, this is the monument to the third international uh, which was designed to be built in st petersburg in 1919 by the russian artist and architect vladimir tatlin uh, for architects when we study history of architecture just as we study the eiffel tower which was realized we also look at this building as one of the great unrealized uh, kind of projects uh, this is a tatlin's tower was uh, intended to be built with industrial materials as you can well see iron glass and steel and was intended as a symbol of modernity uh, the tower's main form is a helical kind of form that goes up to 400 meters and would contain uh, structures which would rotate at different times and at different levels uh, amongst the different functions that this building was meant to house was an information center a news bulletin center uh, for telegraph radio and loud speakers and at the top there was a hemisphere which would uh, contain radio equipment uh, were it a few years down the line probably we would look at this design as a very innovative design for television studios and broadcasting this design uh, of course was never realized but uh, almost 100 years down the line this was and this is a building that was built uh, in 2012 as part of the summer olympic games in london uh, this is a design by anish kapoor and is called the arcelor mittal orbit which rises 114 meters uh, in the in the stratford uh, skies above the stadiums of uh, of the olympic games uh, in london and kapoor said that one of the influences on his design was in fact the tower of babel uh, with the sense of building the impossible uh, that was also almost mythic in its uh, uh, in in its realization and at the same time he also acknowledges both eiffel as well as tatlin as influences uh, on the making of this design uh, as it stands this is probably the largest piece 
of public art uh, built in Britain and very likely built anywhere uh, in the world. Now, visionary architecture like that of Tatlin also got converted almost into an art movement for a short period of time. And that movement was called Futurism. Futurism is an artistic and social uh, kind of movement that originated in Italy in the early 20th century. And it emphasized the modern notions of that time, like speed, technology, youth, even violence, and uh, fetishized through its design objects like <coughs> the car, the aeroplane, and the industrial city. Uh, there are very, I don't think there are any buildings of the futurists, but there are a whole set of drawings which allow us to see their imaginations. And some of this in a very watered down kind of way, we tend to see in Art Deco architecture. So uh, Art Deco has a whole variety of influences, and one of them is uh, futurism. So uh, one of the important uh, practitioners of futurism was the architect Antonio Saint Elia, who was influenced by the industrial cities in the United States, although located in Italy, and made a whole series of drawings uh, of a future city the Chitta Nuova, or the new city, which he considered to be a symbol of the new age. This was never built, like I said, but what this took and influenced as a very obvious muse is the Metropolis in the film Metropolis, which was made in 1927 uh, by the German uh, director Fritz Lang. Uh, and the, the art direction, the cinematography of this film very obviously takes ideas from, uh, from the futurists and their visions. So uh, this was made during the Weimar period between the wars uh, in Germany. And Metropolis is the story of a futuristic urban dystopia uh, that follows the attempt of the wealthy son of the city's ruler and, uh, and his, his, the love of his life, who is a poor worker, to overcome the, caste, the class differences uh, in the city. So in this film, you know, the, the elites and the workers at the other end of the spectrum are always at loggerheads with each other. But they are all seen through these amazing uh, visions of moving tramways, of trains, of flying uh, machines, of, uh, of overhead sky bridges, and so on. The idea of the urban dystopia is a very common idea in fantastic uh, architecture. And I'm sure most of you would recognize this one. Uh, this is an image from Ridley Scott's uh, Blade Runner, which was made in uh, 1982. Uh, based on the adaptation of a novel by uh, the science fiction writer Philip Dick called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And uh, this is a dystopian version of a latter-day metropolis, which is in fact Los Angeles, uh, seen in 2019. Now, 2019 is one year back, okay, and we have to wonder whether what we are seeing in Blade Runner is in fact a vision of the world uh, today. Ridley Scott, of course, is also known for his other famous work of fantasy, which is the film Alien, uh, made in 1979, uh, which is a kind of science horror, science fiction horror film. Uh, but in order to make the images in Alien, he collaborated with the surrealist artist uh, Geiger, H.R. Geiger, uh, who designed the spaceship which you see in this image and the alien itself uh, to appear organic and biomechanical. In Geiger's words, so erotic, it's big vaginas and penises. The whole thing is like you're going inside of some sort of a womb. 
a very visceral kind of experience and if you have seen the film you know it is a very visceral experience when you go inside of this spaceship you encounter this other very iconic image of what is called the space jockey a dead alien sitting at the controls of the spaceship also designed by geiger uh, to to evoke a sense of body horror okay in the in the manner uh, in 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 this very kind of fantastic uh, manner so uh, cinema has been a very useful way by which uh, we can get visions uh, converted into memes in our own head uh, when it comes to that which is fantastic that which is imaginary whimsical and visionary all at the same time but before cinema you had you know literature and the great novels of the science fiction era are some of the best places that you can look for what fantastic architecture can really uh, uh, evoke and i would like to uh, talk to you about three of my favorite uh, novels uh, from uh, the kind of classic era of science fiction uh, the first one is this by arthur c clarke called the fountains of paradise arthur c clarke was a scientist in himself and it is to his credit that uh we have the the concept of the geostationary orbit which is essentially the locating of a of a satellite at a constant location above a point on earth and the realization of satellites to be able to do that uh, in fact is the center of our uh, our world today and the center of our hidden world i do not think anything from the internet to gps to whatever you like is at all possible without the geostationary orbit but arthur c clarke takes the notion of the geostationary orbit and takes it one step further in his novel the fountains of paradise what he imagines is a space elevator where you take a, a space station in geostationary orbit above a location on earth which never changes and connect the two with cables and have an elevator that goes up and down uh, directly taking you know you from earth to uh, to orbit without the necessity of uh, uh, of of uh, of spaceships of space shuttles or whatever you would like rockets or whatever you would like to call it and making it a much more cost effective and renewable uh kind of experience uh when this novel was written uh i think he he does mention at some point that all this is possible only the we do not have the materials that can really handle uh a cable that would run 36000 kilometers uh from earth into uh into geostationary orbit otherwise there's no reason why a building like this cannot be or a a a structure or even infrastructure like this uh, cannot be built and one wonders whether we will see something like this uh, in our lifetime uh, let's see quite distinct from this at the other end of the spectrum is this uh, very interesting novel written by larry niven in uh, 1984 where he imagines architecture actually as a series of trees which are floating in space and uh, they kind of rotate around a sun and because the sun creates solar winds uh, and there is this particular orbit of rotation these trees are always at a certain diagonal with both ends curved a little appearing like the integral sine which we all know uh, from calculus which is how this gets the name and creates an entire world an entire ecosystem of uh, of life of plants photosynthesis animals creatures who all live on this these trees which are free floating uh, in orbit and i i read this in the 80s and it it had this uh, you know its its visions 
kept on staying in my head and probably uh, in in the late 2000s um, uh, 2010 now whenever it was when avatar uh, cameron's film came out i think that was the closest uh, imagery that i thought uh, that that came close to the integral trees but i think the integral trees are also uh, beyond uh, beyond their time you know uh, i would encourage you to find these books and read them they are all fabulous including this third one which is actually a set of four books called cities in flight by james blish uh, in which he imagines entire cities which actually exist being uprooted from their current location um, by a futuristic device an anti gravity device which he calls a spin dizzy and these cities float off in space like independent planets and they they keep on going from one place to the other and there are politics between different floating cities uh in space and amongst the cities which are floating uh, in in these four books for which there are there are a lot of these uh, interactions and conflicts are scranton pennsylvania pittsburgh new york city liverpool dresden budapest and many other such cities so there's an entire uh, kind of ecosystem of uh, of these cities flying all over the place interacting and coming into conflict with each other so the written word can evoke such amazing images uh, in our head uh, and these are the classic kind of covers of these books but i can tell you that when you read them the kind of images that it it brings out in our in your own head in your own imagination is far greater than uh, any cover can can imagine uh let us move a little bit now and look at some buildings which have already been built which have an element of the fantastical in his book uh, fantastic architecture dick wiggins talks about the creation of space which may or may not be functional but which is at least relevant to the sensory environment in which we live uh i have always thought of this building as one of the very interesting uh, examples of fantastic architecture it's quite a famous building uh, it is the bavinger house uh, built in oklahoma uh, united states by the architect bruce goff and this was uh, completed in 1955 it's considered to be a very significant example of uh, organic architecture of architecture that that influences uh, itself from the surroundings and nature and is built with this very logarithmic kind of spiraling uh, design of a local very local yeah. sandstone and is anchored by a repurposed uh, oil field drill which extends into the sky and then the roof is in fact held up by a series of cables looks very interesting from the outside but from the inside it is equally interesting because it is a free flowing space in which the rooms such as they are are actually floating pods and each room is floating by itself as a pod some of these rooms have curtains which can be drawn for privacy but otherwise the space is all one under that uh, very interesting kind of spiral and in fact this notion of the pod was also uh, seen in a very famous uh, science fiction kind of kitsch science fiction film called barbella uh, in 1969 where jane fonda is the is the heroine barbella who finds herself in all sorts of uh interesting situations and these pods are one of the places uh, where she finds herself in uh other buildings that are interesting to look at this set of buildings is one of my favorites these are the cube houses in rotterdam uh in the netherlands designed by the architect piet blom uh, and what he does is he takes conventional houses or conventional cubes and tilts them 
at 45 degrees held up by a uh, by a pylon which is shaped like a hexagon and within them you have the habitable spaces so he imagines this as a village uh, the whole set of buildings as a village but it is a village that consists of trees and each of these buildings is in fact a tree and together they form a kind of village forest uh, it 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 brings in many different uh, notions of the idea of community of living together and also living in spaces that are that are, are that are not standard you know that are quite uh, unusual when you go inside this there is a certain sense of the uh, of the surreal uh, because of the kind of spaces that are formed when you take a conventional cube and tilt it at 45 degrees and then put slabs inside and uh, and and then you live in them uh, equally interesting to look at is this very very famous uh, building built by uh, frank gehry uh, in prague czechoslovakia which is called the dancing house but it's also more popularly called the fred and ginger uh, house because uh, the moment you see this building uh the the image which emerges in 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 one's mind is the very famous image of uh fred astaire and ginger rogers uh dancing in this very amazing kind of dance sequences from a variety of uh musical uh films so this is a very non traditional kind of design but inserted in a very traditional city uh where you have baroque architecture and gothic architecture an art nouveau architecture but is a building from uh, from the 1990s uh, but then gaudi did the same thing didn't he in casa batlo where he he brought in a fantastical building and located right in the middle of the older quarters uh, of barcelona so the there is a sense of the familiar and the unfamiliar in built work that always acts together okay and it is the unfamiliar that kind of evokes our imagination but it requires the familiar to make that imagination stand out uh, and become uh, something that is very very memorable uh, all great fantastic buildings if they are built inevitably become very memorable uh, kind of buildings one extreme when it comes to fantastic architecture perhaps uh, can be this building this is called the blur building which was built in uh, as a media pavilion for the swiss expo in 2002 uh, and this is by the architect architects delasco fidio and renfro uh, here is a building where you have just a deck and you have to walk across a bridge to go to that deck and the building happens when a series of of uh, steam pipes kind of bring out a uh, water vapor and it is that water vapor which kind of accumulates around that disk forming the building uh, try and wrap your head around that so the architecture only happens when the steam makes the form possible and of course the prevailing breezes would mean that the architecture is different at any given time uh this is a very interesting experiment at the notion both of what is the envelope which we conventionally talk about when we talk about architecture the built form and what is the space within which is what the envelope uh, is is uh, in fact uh, uh, enclosing i'm sorry uh one of the great visionary uh, architects uh, was the 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 architect etienne louis boulet uh, who designed a whole series of visionary uh, buildings but only in his imagination and his drawings uh, at the end of the 18th century 
Uh, amongst them, a very famous design of his is a cenotaph for Newton. But I bring you this design, uh, which is that of a, of a grand national library in France. Uh, by this time, the, the French Republic had emerged in its uh, various avatars. And at the same time, there was a sense of expanding literacy uh, in France. And Boulet uh, creates this monumental vault under which you have a series of you know, running shelves, which are most stepped-like in their nature, which allow people to access the books, the hundreds and thousands of books at various levels. Uh, and create this uh, great idea of a, of, a, of a library. But in 2017, we have a library that is in fact realized in China, in, in Tianjin. This is the Tianjin Binhai Library by the architectural firm MVRDV, where you have 33,000 square meters uh, of space forming a large cultural center with this central sphere, which is actually an auditorium, but surrounded all around it are a series of steps, uh, which also act as bookshelves and allow people to access books even as they move, they climb on these shelves. And you have uh, this image of a built form, which is truly out of this world. Uh, but has been uh, kind of realized. It is a fantastic vision. Another fantastic vision quite recently realized in New York City is this one. Uh, this is uh, a giant staircase, and that's the only way to describe it. It has no other function than to be a giant staircase. It's a large climbing frame designed by the architect Thomas Heatherwick and is, uh, is located in the Hudson area of uh, New York, uh, intended to essentially revitalize uh, a brownfield space and bring back you know, people to it. And, and this is just a, a way of creating an iconic uh, kind of eye-catching, fantastical architecture uh, that brings people to it, creates talking points, and in fact, uh, in, invigorates a public space. Uh, this building is made up of 600 tons of steel, has more than 150 flights of stairs, 80 landings, and more than 2,500 steps, and is only intended to create a series of uh, chance encounters, you know, where as you climb up and down these steps, you encounter people, you meet people, you socialize, or wherever you are, you have fantastic views of the surroundings uh, of New York City and of the harbor and beyond. So uh, this is a realized building and is now considered one of the places to visit uh, if you visit uh, New York. These are buildings which is this last set of buildings I showed you are buildings which are actually built. Uh, and we can imagine the impact of these buildings on future buildings which will come. And of course, one would think that you can look back and wonder whether in our own kind of vicinity, whether these things were at all possible. So I'd like to look at a few fantastic visions which are much closer to home. Some are realized and or almost none are realized, but nevertheless, they form an interesting uh, visual library that we can keep uh, in our imagination. I begin with this image, uh, which is that of uh, a proposed head, headquarter kind of building for Infosys, which was uh, envisioned by the architect Hafiz contractor in the early 2000s uh, and was to be located in Mysore. Uh, he did a series of renderings like this each one more fantastic than the other, uh, with the aim perhaps of actually realizing them. But when this building was realized, it ended up looking something like this, which uh, is a bit of a come down 
from the vision itself but i wonder what you think about you know going into a building such as this uh, for your day job another building which hafiz contractor designed but was never built was actually supposed to be the tallest building in the world and that is this one uh, which was again done in the early 2000s and was supposed to come up in gurgaon uh, of course it never came up but you can see through this building uh, probably the you know the essentialization of a series of images of fairy tale uh, architecture of fairy tale castles and you know uh, those those kind of images uh, mostly european i suppose uh, which are seen here in this uh, kind of collection of 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 uh, of cones which are rising into the sky this was intended to be the tallest building in the world like i said and one wonders how we would look at it if it in fact had come up uh, what we have at present to compare with it is the tallest building in the world which is uh, the burj khalifa in uh, in dubai one more building which i think should catch your imagination is this one uh this is a design done by uh a firm called site which uh which were really in the in the 80s at the forefront of uh, environmental architecture even at a time those notions were still just emerging and uh, the chief architect of site an architect called james wines uh was considered a visionary designer and this is a design uh, which if it had been built would probably have been the realization of something truly visionary you would be interested to know that this is a rejected design of antilla <laughs> uh, this building uh, had it come up would have been something uh, James Wines was interviewed by some of our students a few years back and this is what he said at the time site was working for both the ambani brothers in mumbai neither client seemed to know exactly what he wanted mukesh ambani commissioned a house in the sky and a garden and here are some views of the different levels and since there is not enough garden space in the city we thought it might be interesting to create a series of parks in the sky which we called a vertiscape this proposal didn't go off so well so site was dumped and uh, perhaps it is the ambani's loss that this building uh, never came up nevertheless with my very crude photoshop skills what i did was to superimpose the building on the exact site of where antilla is today so you can get an image of what bombay would have looked like had james wines uh, vision uh, actually been uh, realized so uh, there is just as there is a sense of future when it comes to fantastic architecture i think there is also a sense of of nostalgia of regret because of these many many buildings that never came up okay many ideas that have remained embedded in our heads but never seen material uh, kind of form so fantastic architecture has remained with its inherent appeal uh, all down the years and all down the decades and hundreds of years uh, that that uh, we have seen these ideas uh, evoked even if not uh, uh, realized i like to end by just a couple of images uh, and these are a series of picture postcards uh, which were actually made in the year 1900 uh, in france and they depicted the year 2000 i just show you two examples there were more than 80 such cards made where the future was envisioned 100 years down the line uh, in the year 1900 and this is one example where you can see you know a moving building a building that moves uh, in which you have all sorts of activities taking place uh, the chimney probably gives us the impression that 
some sort of steam engine would have run uh, this uh, building please remember that around the time of 1900s even the car was a relatively new uh, uh, new notion uh, railways had already come up but the car as a free uh, a free agent of uh, a vehicle moving on the road was relatively new and this uh, last image uh, is that of uh, of an aero cab station where you have taxis which are in fact flying uh, machines which can transport you from place to place and you can catch these flying uh, taxis at different parts uh, like like a bus stop uh, essentially again an image of 1900 looking towards 2000 funnily uh, if if you are as old as i am we grew up with a series of dates uh, you know about the future and not only talking about fantastic architecture just talking in general about visions of the future okay we look to or when when we were growing up we read a novel called 1984 and it was not yet 1984 okay and we were thinking okay you know this is a vision of the future that of 1984 and so on and this is what will happen and then 1984 came and went and well nothing really happened and then we look forward to 2001 uh, which is the uh, the date of arthur c clarke's 2001 a space odyssey and said okay that is a vision of the future where you know human beings will have spaceships that go right up to saturn and jupiter and so on and we will meet extraterrestrial beings and of course nothing of that sort happened and we saw dystopian visions of blade runner which are of the year 2019 and well we can see how much of that is reality so in the same way you know uh, fantastic architecture works in both directions janus faced you know it looks to the future it looks to the past it creates nostalgia it creates awe and it creates regret all in equal uh, measure so uh, thank you very much i just end with this rather wonderful image Uh, of the interior of the sagrada familia uh, by uh, 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 by gaudi and uh, thank once again uh, himangi for sharing her images of barcelona and i thank you all uh, for your attention i hope uh, this has been an uh, an interesting and a fun uh, presentation so thank you so much and thank you uh, professor dalvi for sharing your impressive knowledge on this wonderful topic uh today um sorry my video just came on and uh, you know i have to confess that i have actually seen parts of this presentation a few years ago uh that mustan sir presented at another forum and that kind of inspired me to go to barcelona and actually check out all the gaudi um uh, structures he's uh, he's presented in fact i sent him my images he didn't like them enough to present them <laughs> but that that's okay uh but you know i i was just thinking uh, just going through your presentation and all the wonderful buildings that you presented you know uh, you know uh, what are i mean you presented in the past and i think the last one was uh, you spoke about the hedwig building in in, in new york uh, and the, the the chinese library in which was built in 2017 is which are the more current buildings because for me i mean um, seeing your presentation i my mind keeps going there i had the fortune of going to the qatar uh, national museum uh, yes. built by jean noel um, last twice yeah. and yeah. that's built like the desert rose which according to me is a fa fabulous example of fantasy architecture and and uh, it's quite quite uh, quite striking in a way um, but um, So, in your opinion, I mean, how can uh, you know fantasy architecture of the past um, set a design language uh, for for the present? And uh, and uh, it's a follow up question, which has come from an audience: is Are there any current examples of fantasy architecture in India at the moment, in the current times? Well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, if, if you want, if we want to kind of make a certain string. of ideas as they continue one can see that uh perhaps the most famous fantasy building uh is the sydney opera house 
okay which everyone knows the way it is shaped it was designed to look like sails billowing in the wind in the sydney harbor and created out of shells uh, in concrete then those very shells were re repurposed isn't it by faribu saba in the bahai temple in delhi which was in the form of a almost like a lotus okay and uh, we we looked at that as a great example of fantasy architecture in india okay and uh, the the lotus was repurposed shall we say i'm not saying there's a direct connect but there is always an embedded sense of the visual in the desert roads in uh, in in qatar by john nouvel so one can trace ideas uh, both realized and unrealized as they move through time and as they get material form okay so we have many questions and i have a few also but i will get to mine i'm just going to start so what's the role of uh, uh, of innovation science technology even science fiction as you touched upon uh, played in f- facilitation of fantastical designs to become a reality see uh, if we take away the notion of the built then it is a free for all mm-hmm. okay and i think that is what we should locate ourselves in because then science and technology allows us to create new imaginations of the future okay and as science like say right from the industrial revolution we have seen images of the future if you if you read the work of jules verne if you read the work of hg wells and later you read the work of people like clark and asimov and so on uh, you find images of the future whether they are architectural or otherwise uh, you have a lot of infrastructural images uh, of the future and then you have also had a series of visual artists you know who have imagined the future I, i mean this is a short talk otherwise one would bring in uh, say the work of piranesi you know who <laughs> imagined uh, in 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 the post uh, renaissance kind of period fantastic prisons you know which just came out of his imagination but when we look at his etchings they are amazing interior spaces uh, okay or i showed you the work of boule who is again uh, a visual kind of Im- you know imagineer shall we say uh, even though the buildings are are never built and there are such other people also uh, even in in the last 50 years the work of peter cook of uh, of such archie gram such firms who looked at looking uh, at at very imaginary uh, and imaginative kind of architecture for the future remember that even an architect like zaha hadid uh mm-hmm. in began her career by making drawings of uh an an architecture of the imagination which she was only a little later allowed to realize uh through her built uh, projects so uh that that is the thing you know the ideas come first the realization happens uh by and by sure that that was another example that came to mind so uh, there's a question from paramita bora uh, i'm wondering if you could speak a little to the idea of political meaningfulness of fantasy especially in the context of indian contemporary discussions where realism seen as an aesthetic of progressive politics uh, well sure uh, but this has been the case in the past as well you know say the 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 whole notion of the iconic building okay which is a tall building which towers over all the other buildings has always been a political statement no matter whichever way you look at it okay because that is the building that becomes then a wayfinding device it is something that can be seen from great distances uh one of the best examples of that kind of a building is the rajabai tower uh, in bombay okay the rajabai tower has uh, as you are aware it's a tall tower in the new gothic style it has clock faces it even rings uh, you know uh, it, it chimes at different times of the day and on that on on the body of the tower you have these 8 foot high stone sculptures of different types of indians whom the who are referred to as the races of india so in that sense it forms what is what is called a panopticon you know it is overseeing the 
space around the subject the subject population around and so on so even when you look at more recent examples if you take say the statue of unity which is the world's tallest statue okay it it acts in that similar panoptical kind of manner you know mm-hmm. that you look up to it but it looks at you at the same time so there is a politics in that you know there is uh, an inherent kind of uh, differential of power that gets created is something that is much bigger than you and you imagine yourself either as an acolyte or as an ant whichever way you want to uh, you know uh, in in relation to that uh, that uh, immense kind of building just moving on we have any questions um, any thoughts on a theme park architecture example disney based ones which are largely fantasy components hotels shops you know like if you look at a you know willy wonka the chocolate factory essentially type so yeah but then you see very soon in the life of disney they all got realized in the form of the disney lands mm-hmm. that came up all over the world true okay and then the disney lands had a visual vocabulary that translated into actual architecture you you find uh, buildings that are done by michael graves and so on which actually have mickey mouses on them okay but they are used as architectural ornaments in the way that our neo gothic ornaments uh, on on buildings like uh, like vt uh, uh, are used mm-hmm. so uh, they have been realized in fact afis contractors imagination of the tallest building in the world directly i think yeah. can be related to the logo of the disney of walt disney productions sure. which is their the, the the central building in most disney lands which is that what is it called the yeah. fantastic tower the pa- mm-hmm. or the fantastic palace something like that uh, it, there is a there is a name for that so you know those are part of the vocabulary in your hand even as you try to put pencil on paper sure and as you were even presenting uh, you know hafiz's uh, impression i my mind still straight went to burj khalifa so it's already there so it's you know the fantasy has become a reality Uh, yes. so divya has posted many interesting questions so i mean we can't get to all of them and i'm just going to go them in in a few so what do you think about scientific anti realistic architecture i don't even know what that means yeah, i i thought But you would i, I would I, i assume it means that avant garde you know something that is speculated that can happen in the future but has not yet happened right and i think you know uh, what arthur c clarke proposes in the fountains of paradise is one such example you know one can really imagine a space elevator happening in the future maybe even in the near future okay and maybe elon musk can make it happen who knows uh, but it hasn't happened as yet but is within the realm of imagination so i'm just going to uh, just change gear a little you know avid uh, is is pretty keen uh, on doing these talks on sustainability and sustainability now is a series we've been doing with the csfbs so how do you feel how do we inject fantasy into eco architecture and the and practice imaginative but sustainable and responsible uh, dis- building design for the future how do you marry the two it's the other way around asad if you practice eco architecture it will be fantastic No so I I didn't really mean that you know we don't do enough of it look at what James Wines proposed for Antilla okay he proposed an example of eco architecture yeah had we had that building been built it would have been a shining example of eco architecture not only for bombay but probably for the world over so it's the other way around because you know when you design for ecology mm-hmm. you end up with a series of forms which are very very unconventional especially when we look at the architecture that we practice today so uh, just moving on uh, what are uh, your views on parametric architecture now carving out its own ism as parametricism as a futuristic fantasy aesthetic of contemporary times this question is from sanjay mathre mustafa sir uh yeah okay Sorry. i i could not hear you very clearly but you did talk about parametric architecture uh, right. can i just ask whether you can hear me clearly i can hear you clearly yeah sure 
So parametric architecture is essentially what is uh, currently done uh, in architecture today, where you where you can put down a series of parameters and have the computer generate forms for you. These are forms that uh, are unpredictable. These are forms that you do not generate in your own imagination, other than putting down the parameters. And to a very large extent, these are fairly impossible to sit down and draw by yourself. So what the the architect is then uh, led to do is to have a series of these forms which emerge through parametric processes and pick and choose what they like and then try to give them a reality. So this is what is already happening. That is why today, to a very large extent, you can build buildings in almost any shape, which even 30 years down the line, when I was a student of architecture, one could not say so. OK. Uh, there is one uh, question about a book that one could read. And I'm trying to find the question because there's so many. Uh, that would be the best go-to on fantasy architecture. I'm trying to find the question. But yeah, uh, that's from Shefali. Is there a book that you can read about fantasy architecture, comprehensive one? Or which one would that be? Uh, well, there is uh, the, the book by... Uh, by Dick Wiggins called Fantasy Architecture. That is what you can read. But of course, my lecture is a kind of accumulation of many ideas from many sources. True. So, I mean, just moving on to the present times that we're living in is, you know, how would COVID-19 impact the language uh, of design and construction and fantasy, uh, if at all? Would it, would it be you know, we're living in, in, in unreal times in a way. So uh, do you think it's going to spur more uh, fantastical ideas? I don't know about fantastic, but it'll probably spur a lot of better architecture. Okay, because it will make us do things that we have, uh, we have consistently avoided doing. For example, the sense of scale. Okay, more and more we find that there is a limit to how small you can make something and inhabit it, mm -hmm. uh, especially over a period of time. And thanks to the notions of social distancing and so on, we now will probably have spaces which are a little larger, uh, you know, that, that will form part of our landscape. And I think that is primarily a good thing. Uh, we will also have to very critically look at buildings such as, you know, the, the slum rehabilitation projects, which are allowed to come up so close to each other, because they then, and they have already been uh, uh, associated with the spread of disease even before uh, uh, COVID. So mm -hmm. that would become another uh, uh, thing to look at. And of course, uh, uh, COVID, one of the best ways to deal with COVID is to build well-ventilated spaces. Mm -hmm. So if we can go back to an age when everything was not air conditioned and we designed in a way that the breeze blew through our our homes and offices freely i think uh, it will all be for the good so so monica asks is is uh, experiential design fantasy architecture all design is experiential isn't it uh, mm -hmm. most of the time we talk about fantasy because it is visual it's because it is a a treat to our eyes if we bring in other senses, then the notion of fantasy would probably get expanded in many, many uh, different ways. But in architecture, that has not been done too well so far. So I'm just going to wrap up with a few few questions. So Musanza, what got you excited about this topic? Why, why, why fantasy architecture? How did that start? Well, I've been interested in, in the imagine, imaginary and the imaginative all the, uh, right right since i was a child and i have been fed with a wealth of images uh, thanks to books uh, movies and most importantly as far as i am concerned comics because comic books gave me the visual imagination as i was growing up and i still go back to them from time to time uh, when when i need to do that and that 
vision of the future. In fact, I showed you one image of comics when I showed you the elephant in Tigers and Traitors. Uh, okay, uh, that is an image which I must have seen even before I was ten years old. Okay, and that has stayed with me all these all all these years. So uh, the the idea of the fantastic was always there, and once I started studying architecture, that kind of melded into notions of how they can actually be realized. And then you looked at a whole series of other imaginations which were architectural, which I had not seen in my growing up years. Uh, through the study of architecture, and both these came together in interesting ways. So there's a, a question from uh, Mr. Your your colleague, Mr. Pitker. I think uh, I feel fantasy should be encouraged in architectural education, where it generally gets suppressed. What would you say? Entirely so, and I do agree that it gets suppressed at the same time. He's absolutely right. You know, architecture deserves once in a while a kick up the backside. and i think fantasy architecture does that as well as anything else so so you you uh, you know you 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 presented amazing examples so what's your top 3 you know fantastical architectural uh, piece de resistance exactly you know the, your your favorite examples is it the gaudi buildings or if they are if you're talking about built architecture i suppose so the gaudi buildings would probably be uh, one of the best Uh, although i must say that i one of the places i do look forward to going and seeing the buildings are the ones in the middle east which mm-hmm. have just come up you know right uh, sharja qatar abu dhabi dubai and those places they seem to be the new kind of uh, uh, very fertile grounds for a lot of these visions to come up uh, if you want one building that i have seen that absolutely blew my mind it would have to be the guggenheim in bilbao yeah by frank gary and of course i have been to the fred and ginger building and i can tell you it's a delight to visit as well wonderful uh, there's there's another building in saudi actually which has come up in the middle of the desert which is all mirror which it kind of it gets blended into the surroundings quite quite surreal in a way but um uh thank you uh, mustan sir for this this wonderful uh, presentation i wish you know we could uh, we could uh, you know answer all the many questions that we had uh but in the interest of time and keeping keeping on time is one of avid's trademarks um uh but thank you for this wonderful presentation thank you to our partners the kalagora association brinda miller and her team for generously collaborating with us thank you to our participants we've had such an overwhelming response um and all of you are being here and I, I think most of you are staying here through the session, which is a good sign of Mustansir's uh, 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 spell that he cast on you in the in the area of fantasy. Um, uh, and so, stay tuned for more programs from Avid Learning. Our our next uh, session in the Blurring Boundaries uh, uh, series is the Global Language of Design on the fifteenth of October. and the following thursday after that we have learning boundaries collaboration and art making today on the 22nd where we have a wonderful collaboration of of six um uh, uh visual um artists um which is which is quite quite stunning and it, that that project will unveil in the in in the month uh as as we get to the 22nd to find out more about our programs you know just follow us at avid learning or go to our website until next time stay safe stay healthy and remember that learning never stops thank you very much thank you professor dalvi again and thank you sir thank you for the opportunity